right. Hello, lovely people. Welcome to another amazing episode of the Living in Fullness podcast. I am excited to sit with one of my favorite South Africa's one of South Africa's favorite comedians. Let me just put that. But my favorite <laughs> at the moment, Jason Goliath. I'm, I'm so excited <laughs> to be here. And I wish that you told me that you were going to have your face done. Because then I would have at least shaved and looked decent. Because I feel very underdressed. Because you look like <laughs> you look like you're expecting Oprah in this You chair. look amazing. I mean, and then you, I look like Monday. I, I had like, to dress up for you. You're worth the dress, the dress up. Then I feel I feel like I missed it. Because you, know, you know when people invite you for a podcast, it's a, yeah. it's a roll of the dice. Are they going to be cameras? Yeah. Or is it going to be like radio where I can sound well-groomed, <laughs> but don't necessarily have to be? So yeah. sorry, I should have shown you for you. I feel bad. No, you bad. look amazing. I'm sure they can agree I with me. I appreciate your lies <laughs> yeah, very no. much. Thank you. I'm not lying. Trust me. <laughs> so are we ready? We're excited to have you here. How are you feeling? I feel great. I feel great. It's uh, it's Monday. It's a new week, new opportunities, yeah. um, you know, new reasons to get out of bed and get it done. Yay, let's get into it. So I've got two types of icebreakers for you. Yeah, yeah. So three, uh, uh, the first one, I'll give you three words. that Don't you even would just go, just start. Just give start. us a comedy. Just start. First icebreaker, let's go. First icebreaker. Yeah. Toilet seat. Throw yes. a comedy for us. Uh, the, 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 the toilet seat is a conundrum. The toilet seat is a, is a major conundrum because it's like Thor's hammer. Because some of us can just lift it up easy, <laughs> easy. And then some people, if you're not anointed with Thor's hammer, you can't lift it up. It becomes yeah. impossible. It also has some sort of magnetic pull mm. because, and it only affects yellow liquids. So if you, if you, you can't, you can't, <laughs> you try to go straight, yeah. but it bends. It like it, 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 there's no way to not splash on the toilet seat. I, I don't know there, no, 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 If I knew no. science, there would be a scientific term for the electromagnesis of, li of liquids. Um, <laughs> and, and we can't help but, but, but splash on it. So uh, the toilet seat is also there kind of as a test of your marriage. Mm. And your marriage, <laughs> your marriage is solid if your wife just puts the seat down and carries on with her, with her life. Listen. But if she calls you in there, it's generally a sign of other things you're not doing. Mm. And this is just the straw that broke the camel's back. <laughs> this is just, so, so look at the toilet seat in, in a different light. Um, and then also as a man, it's your throne. So when replacing your toilet, <laughs> be like me. I sat on every single toilet at Leroy Merlin. My wife was so embarrassed. I said, no, my darling, you don't understand. I spend a lot of time here. I spend a lot of time here. A man must be sure because I've been fooled once with the wrong toilet seat. And, you know, if the diameters are not right and the, it's about the back because there's, there's the pipe. And then if yeah. you don't have a straight situation, you're in trouble. Mm, okay. You got into the next word, marriage. <laughs> marriage. It is incredibly difficult even with the right person. But mm. when it's right, it will be the greatest thing you'll ever experience. Mm. I, the way I describe marriage is if you are getting married, so if you're, if you're a young man or woman and you're about to get married and the yeah. reasons that you're getting married are because you are looking for a partner that will mm -hmm. give you equality, um, shared roles and responsibility, mm -hmm. um, somebody that is going to give you fairness, fairness, clear, dis clear distinctions between right and wrong, mm. then you are wasting your time. But if you are getting married for magic, mm. then you come to the right place. Because that's what marriage is. It's magic. <laughs> yeah. I married the person that annoys me most, and I miss her the second I don't see her. Like, I miss her in between blinks. You did that's not how lie. Much I miss her. Like, <laughs> like, you know, so, so um, you can't make sense of it. it, it, it but, but when it's right, it's the best thing you'll ever do. And I think it's, it's the access to the greatest version of you when it's right. Mm. I cannot add more. Here we go. The last word. But it's not easy. Don't just get married. Hey, <laughs> it's not. Take your time. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Take your time. Because like I said, it's hard even when you marry to the right person. Mm, it's hard. Let's go. Escom. Escom. Hey. <laughs> I, I, I always thought that, that, that Escom was some sort of vernacular for failure, disappointment, and broken promises. Um, I, think, I think Escom is like... A lot of the cars you see on South, in South Africa, you know, you'll, you'll be driving in South Africa, you'll see a car that's five years old and it is smoking as if it's never been serviced. <laughs> that's ESCOM. The driver of that car just moves <laughs> on a hope and pray. You know what I mean? Yeah. They jump in, they put petrol, they think the fumes from the petrol are the Holy Spirit, but it's another type of spirit. <laughs> and then they just go. And then mm. ESCOM is exactly the same. It's this, 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 this vehicle that was never produced, I think, with the thought of how many people it's going to have to serve. Mm -hmm. uh, and then people don't service it, which means it breaks down every day. My worst part is that, you know that moment when the lights come back on or yeah. the moment when the lights go off? If you're yeah. in a crowd of people, people tend to cheer nowadays mm. and it makes me angry. I'm just like, <laughs> we should not be celebrating 
We need to be more angry, guys. <laughs> more angry. We need to be more angry. <laughs> yeah. This too. Ooh, well done. Thank you. I love that. I mean, this is this is your flow. Yeah, I it's mean, so easy for and you. I'm, I'm listening. We're, we're just getting warmed up. <laughs> yes. If your life was a movie, what title would it be? If my if my life was a movie, I don't have a mm-hmm. title, but I always say to people that that's the way I think about my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm always like, you know, I think what COVID taught us is that we don't have time. Mm. Uh, and I think a lot of people are, are living their lives and saying like vicarious things like, I'm going to be happy when, I'm going to do this when. Mm. And I think COVID taught me specifically that we don't have a when. Mm. So if you're not on it right now, uh, then, then, then what are you doing? What is the question again? Because I got too excited. <laughs> Tell me your title. Um, oh, the title of the movie. So, yeah. so then I'm like, if, if, if imagine you die, you get to, to heaven, and before you go in, Prapita says, before I can access, you must watch your movie. <laughs> mm. Then I'm always like, if I press I, and there's drama between brackets. You know, sometimes you press I to just to see what the vibe is. Yeah, what it's like. And there's drama between brackets. I change yeah. the channel immediately. My <laughs> life my life movie must fall into the, the, the action romance. I mm. think that's, I don't know if it's a new category, but action romance. Like mm. it must be Skopsky and Donner. That's what I okay. always say. It must be heavy <laughs> action, sex scenes, galore, galore, galore. Mm. I always say like, in the whole movie, my wife has side poop, I have side poop. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? It must yeah. be. Yeah. Filled with emotion, filled mm. with passion, filled with experiences, and filled with things that actually matter. Because mm. somehow, I think we've become obsessed as a as a society with things that don't actually matter. Sure, that's um, so true. And I, and I think people always go, okay, but then what actually matters? Then I go, mm. no, that depends on you. Because mm. what actually matters to me matters to me. Yeah. And I think that's the problem, is people have a view now of other people's lives through mm. platforms like social media. Mm. Then you see somebody that you assume is similar to you doing something that you're not doing and your brain goes, oh my God, oh my God, should I do that? Yeah. And then my friend, I under MVP has this line. She goes, own race, own pace. And that's the way I see it. Mm. You've got to understand your lane before you can stay in your lane. Because mm. if you don't know where you're going, it's yes. every off-ramp you think you must move to the left. <laughs> True. But if you know where you're going, you're comfortable in your lane, mm. you're comfortable at your speed, that's going to get you to where you need to get on time. Mm. So that when somebody passes you, your brain goes, oh, that person is just later for their meeting than yes. I am for mine. Mm. Their speed, their progress has got nothing to do with to me. To do with you. As long mm. as I know what I'm trying to achieve and where I'm going, that's the important part. I love that you have to understand your lane for you to oh. stay in it. Because we always say, stay in your lane, but what is my lane? What am am I even in the right lane? What does that mean? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So staying in your lane means for me personally Mm -hmm. it means try and be as clear as possible as your destination so what is Mm. the objective why are you on this journey in the first Mm. place your why makes it easy to overcome things so for example if your if your why is this beautiful holiday or you're Mm. going to a friend's wedding in durban now you get stuck in traffic you don't just turn around because Mm. it's worth sitting in that traffic you know what i mean it's worth those those potholes and those barriers that you're going to encounter and Mm -hmm. that's going to give you the energy to carry on but if you're going to durban just to waste time and money (laughs) now the road is closed now there's riots happening Mm. your brain goes i don't need this i Mm. actually have comfort and tv and netflix at home yeah i might as well go back i'm going back home so so your why is is so important Mm. so just understand where you're going then so i i I, in my brain it works like like a gps so you it's it's the gps can help you get anywhere on earth Mm. right but it needs two things Mm -hmm. it needs a destination but it also needs a start point. Mm. And I think a lot of people are in denial about where they are right now. So my word is, you first have to accept. It doesn't matter whether you're in a good place or a bad place. You Mm. are where you are and it is what it is. So once you accept, I'm here, now you can use the GPS to go, okay, I'm here, I want to get there. Then the GPS will work out a number of routes for you. You can check Mm. the route you want to take. You select your route. The best part is, once you selected your route and pressed go on your journey, that first step is the most important mm. of any journey. But you'll notice the GPS no longer shows you the destination. Mm. It just shows you the next step. So yes. it just, instead of showing you Durban, it just says in 200 meters, turn, turn right. Yeah. Then you only need to be obsessed mm. with, and I'm going to use that word a lot, obsessed with <laughs> yeah. getting to that 200 meter mark and turning right. You check the next instruction, you continue. So you first understand where you are. You then understand where you're going. And then you plot your route, how long mm. you think it's going to take, what type of effort you're going to need to put in. And mm. then you start with step one, become obsessed with step one. Mm. When you achieve step one, you become obsessed with step two. And I before you that. know it, before you know it, you are doing podcasts with famous people. It happens. It happens. Yes. 
I love it. And I'm seated with Jason Goliath. <laughs> okay, so if you I mean, were I mean, to... me with you. I mean, me with you, just so you understand. Humble. No, 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 no. Humble, guys. <laughs> Very humble. You have to be. <laughs> so tell me, if you were to switch roles with another comedian just for a day, who will it be and why? Obviously, Trevor Noah. Why? So that I can experience what it's like to have Uber Jet. You see, you and me, <laughs> we every now and then spoil ourselves with Uber Black. Yes. I'm telling you, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm telling you, Trevor has an app on his phone. So you want Uber Jet? 100%. <laughs> he opens his app, it goes, where are you now, Trevor? Rand Park Ridge. Where do you want to go? Los Angeles. Oh, wow. Okay. Then I'm, I guarantee you, there's a limo that comes to fetch him from here and takes him to the closest helipad. The helicopter takes him to the, a jet that's already waiting on the runway that for him. That is the last. That's a I just want to experience that money just for one day just for one day the type of money that means you can <laughs> think about everything because there's some things yeah. that when you ask me jason do you want to do that my budget answers for yes you don't I even love know. to but my budget <laughs> is like <laughs> do you see what the rent is 18 <laughs> rand we are staying i have no then, option I mean, trevor doesn't care about that the <laughs> exchange rate of south africa come on <laughs> okay, so we're going to end the um, icebreakers with your morning routine. Tell us what your morning routine is like. Uh, my morning routine is mm -hmm. is uh, you know I'm an, I'm an, I'm a night owl, so I, I generally try to sleep in whenever I can. I'm not one of those five a.m. club uh, people. I'm more um, make make whatever time you're waking up your five a.m. Mm. So my life doesn't work like a normal nine to five. I get that five a.m. club. You know, mm. get, a, get ahead of it. But very often I'm only going on stage at half past 10. Mm. Um, and, and if I woke up at five o'clock that day, I simply wouldn't have enough energy to yeah, be on stage by at the half time. past 10. So, so mm. my life works um, based on my schedule and, and based on, on, on how product, productive I need to be. So my mornings actually begin the night before. Mm. And the, the night before is, is A, I check my day. I understand how much energy I need mm -hmm. uh, for, that, for that day. I remind myself that I'm capable of every single input in that diary. Mm. I'm capable of all the things I'm going to do tomorrow. Um, I make a small note of what I'm what I'm grateful for mm -hmm. uh, in my life, and these are small, mediocre things. I'm grateful that I have an amazing wife who loves and supports me, and we have a relationship that works. Aww. I'm grateful that I get to work with my best friends and my mm. family, and I'm most grateful for the fact that I think I'm luckier than a lottery winner in the sense that I get paid to do my favorite thing. Yes. So if you think about whatever your favorite thing is. That's how lucky I am. Yeah. When I do my favorite thing, whatever your favorite thing is, mm. when I do my favorite thing, people say thank you and give me money. And that, quite frankly, makes me luckier That's than fulfilling. somebody who's won the lottery in the country. Mm. I think there's more people who have won the lottery than there are people who, who, who have not. Mm. In the morning, the habit is simple. So my wife generally wakes me up with a cup of coffee, which is my, my, my favorite way. Mm -hmm. um, and while enjoying a cup of coffee, that's my time to first... Be grateful. Mm. So when I wake up, I first am grateful for the things I've done and achieved and have already. Mm. Once I celebrate that gratitude and give thanks, then I switch on the ambition to uh -huh. go and chase down the things I don't have yet. Mm. I have conversations with myself in the morning and, and over, you know, I, I read a meme over COVID that became a, a, a kind of daily mantra or part mm -hmm. of my daily mantra, which simply said, change the way you speak to yourself by changing small words. Mm. And the example it gave is the example I use every day is simply change the word have to to get to. Mm. So okay. in the morning, when I wake up on a Monday morning, it's easy to go, oh, I have to go do a podcast. Yeah. But if I go, I get to go and do a podcast, mm. there's a different energy That's with which different. you approach mm. that. And I've realized how sensitive I am particularly to the energy with which I approach stuff. Mm. Uh, and the result of that stuff is generally governed by the energy with which I came in. Mm. So... By changing the word, I get to. It helps me exist in that space of gratitude. And for me, acceptance and gratitude are like the founding fathers of happiness. Mm. Like if I can if I can force myself to exist in that space. And, and Nicholas Goliath has a great saying. He's always saying, uh, don't be the cloud, be the silver lining. Oh, and beautiful. that's exactly. So, so it doesn't mm. matter how big the storm. I'm kind of just looking for what the silver lining is. Mm. I hang on to that and then we go through. I love that. And I, I really agree with you because I'm, I'm a big fan of using the right words to yes. motivate myself. There's so much power in the tongue. And sometimes we we set the tone of the day in everything we want to do Absolutely. just by the little words that we speak and they get stuck into our head. So I really love that. What makes me happy about what you just said is mm. it's indicative of the fact that you are responsible. Mm. 
Nobody else is responsible no. to make your day nice. <laughs> it's you. you are responsible. Mm. The way you the way you appreciate, operate, uh, and achieve today is mm. up to you. And when you start by taking that type of responsibility, um, then you understand the importance of the way you speak to yourself. Because mm. for me, the way I speak to myself even changes the way I hear other people speaking True. to me. Mm. So if I get to somewhere and I'm in a bad mood, somebody says something maybe with no emotion, mm. it leads me to maybe they're, oh, they're, yes. they're being aggressive. <laughs> if I get there in a happy place, I'm like, oh, no, they're just you, being yeah, happy. It, it, you know what I mean? Yeah, I totally agree with you. So tell us, how did you get into comedy? I'm sure you get asked this a lot, but how did you get into it? What was the motivation? How did you take that first step? So the, the short answer is, thank mm -hmm. God for Nicholas Goliath. Mm -hmm. That's the short answer. Nicholas Goliath made the best decision um, that I'll ever make. And that came as a result of, I'd, I'd, and I'm sure we'll chat about all of these things, but I'd mm -hmm. failed terribly in business. I, I ran an insurance brokerage mm -hmm. um, and the economic crisis of 2008, which is very similar to the one we're going through yeah. right now, uh, destroyed my business. That combined mm -hmm. with bad decisions, uh, taking on the wrong type of business partners mm -hmm. within, the, within the business led to a magnificent crumble and I lost everything. Like mm -hmm. I still deal with lawyers and paying back debt today. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of those horrific stories. And, you know, I'd, I'd always wanted to be an entertainer, but mm -hmm. my mom worked for MNET, which meant I saw entertainers. Mm -hmm. And my perspective was... I see these people wearing designer outfits with designer yes. hairstyles and designer mm -hmm. face beats, and all of them were leaving in old leaky VW Beetles. Like, and I was <laughs> like, "Are oh, you guys are getting these clothes for free? But you're not really making money." Making money, yeah. And, and my brain went so, and like, there is no rich and famous in South Africa. It's mm -hmm. like either or. And so I spent most of my 20s just trying to get rich, just trying to work as hard as I can because I was like, "Okay, do I want rich or fame?" And mm -hmm. at the time, I was so obsessed with money. And now yeah. everything crumbles, everything stops. And uh, a wise friend of mine, Pedro Magos, who, who owns uh, uh, Magos Media, uh, Pedro said to me when I, when I decided to not do any emceeing and, and mm. any entertainment, he said, boy, I'm just letting you know as your friend, this thing is a drug. Like entertainment will never leave you. That it will always be there and go mm. and do whatever you want in the world. But at some point you're going to have to be honest with yourself and, mm. and entertain. So my business closes, I've got nothing, and I think to myself, okay, Maybe kind of acting and presenting is a mm. thing that I can that I can do. I'd been emceeing for a very long time. I I worked in a in a macro store on the microphone every weekend, mm. to, doing a specialized selling thing, and uh, I start acting and presenting. So so Pedro is registered at that point. Had opened an agency called Legends and. Mm calls me up and he goes, just come and register with the agency and yeah. go for a couple of auditions, see what happens. Mm -hmm. And I start going for auditions and my hit rate is sensational. Like oh. for every for every second audition I went to, so I, I booked mm -hmm. I booked one in two. For every two auditions I went to, I booked a job and it was just insane. That's amazing. It, no, it was insane. It was it was more than amazing for me because sure. I needed it so desperately. And mm -hmm. very quickly I book a very big beer commercial mm -hmm. and uh, become the face of this this iconic South African brand. Mm -hmm. But on the on the day we meet, I meet a guy called Sivin Giesi and another guy called Brian Fanikerk, who at the time were established actors in the country. I spent five days shooting with these guys, mm. and, and I learned so much from them, and we, we just have the best vibe and energy on set. And at the end of those five days, they go, brah, we think you should try stand-up comedy. So Siv goes, seriously, dude need to try stand-up comedy and yeah. I go dude I'm funny around the pry with my friends like I'm not funny on stage <laughs> I've been watching comedy for 10 years at this point and I'm just like I'm not I'm not that, that guy person. and so mm. it goes relax brah I'm not saying you're going to become a rich and famous comedian <laughs> I'm just saying I think Come you'll enjoy it. it you mm. obviously enjoyed making us laugh I think you'll enjoy stand-up comedy try it as a hobby mm. don't try it as a as a as a, like a, career, as a career opportunity mm. or you know, try it as a hobby, like somebody would try bungee jumping, go-karting, whatever it is, mm. you know what I mean, skydiving, try it as a hobby, I really think you'll enjoy it. And I honestly think that is the best advice I ever got, and it's mm. the advice I give young people wanting to try stand-up or anything in entertainment at yeah. the moment, is is try it because I think you love it. You love it. Mm. Not because you think that you're going to be whatever, Earn money put, put from all it. of that pressure mm. on it. And I have this conversation with Nicholas Goliath, we were very drunk when we had the conversation, <laughs> it, was, it was Mother's Day, I'll never forget mm -hmm. at Nicholas's house, 
and, and him and I were very, very drunk. And I tell him about what these guys have said about me starting comedy. And Nick had tried once or twice before and he kind of hadn't tried for the, the three years prior. And he said, yeah, I think I'm also ready to start again. We're both very drunk at this point. Yeah. And anyway, we, we, I forget about the conversation. I go home. And the next morning, while sleeping off my hangover, Nicholas calls me and says, I've made, an, I've made a booking for us. And I go, what are you talking about? And he says, no, I've booked, <laughs> I've booked us an open spot at the and underground. And you thought you were just talking. Iconic club. And I said, no, bro, we were drunk on Black Label. You can't make... <laughs> Contracts on black label, <laughs> yeah. calling, those contracts don't work. Mm -hmm. And he said, hey, that lady gave me a hard time because I said to her that myself and my cousin want to try. And she said, I hope you guys aren't playing the fool. So he's like, we got six weeks, bruh. And that's how I started. We had six weeks. I said to Nick, cool, tell your wife we're going to be going to the comedy show every yeah. Sunday just to figure it out. And six weeks later, 3rd of July, 2011, we jumped on stage. You even remember the date. Uh, it was the best day of my <laughs> life. My life, uh, it was one of those days where I felt my universe seat like mm. i can't you know like when you when you're turning the petrol cap and it's not on not on click yeah that's what happened in my life my life clicked into the seated position um and i remember loving my first performance so much that my brain just went i have to work as hard as i can doing everything else so that i can do this hobby as much as possible mm. so imagine somebody who 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 does mountain biking for the first time and realizes that they are, it's their perfect escape yeah. their brain goes i've got to work as hard as possible mm. to buy the best bikes to be able to afford to go to the different tracks mm. my brain did that with comedy it was like I've got to work as hard, as hard as possible so mm. I can afford the time it takes to, to, do, this, do, to this. do this thing because this is the best thing I've mm. ever done. Comedy was, the, was and still is the best thing I've ever done. And That's the rest an, is history, I suppose. And it, it comes to you so naturally. Like, you're so good at it. Uh, I mean, it, it's like when you're on stage, I'm like, did he actually script it? Did he think about it? <laughs> you know, because <laughs> I actually wonder, do you script your, um, your stand-ups? So, you know, I, I, I don't, is the, okay. is the truth. So there are many different styles. Mm -hmm. uh, Nicholas and Donovan, for example, will write out their jokes. And I okay. think classic comedians often write out the jokes and then you kind of figure out where the laughs are and adjust the lines accordingly. So if there's no laughs, you need that line, you'll take mm. it out. Where, with me, uh, my last two one-man shows, I don't have a single note. I don't have a set list. I don't have anything written down. But it all kind of happens in my head. So what I do have mm -hmm. is... If, if something makes me laugh and I think mm -hmm. something is funny, I'll write that down. Okay. But what the experience has helped me do is I now think about what do I want to say? Because I think mm. that was the big thing that happened to me during COVID. When the audiences went away, I felt extraordinarily guilty that I mm. had audiences. And did I even say anything? Oh, did I, I see. tell them anything or did I just make them laugh in that mm. moment? Or So I'm always like, if people are listening – say something mm. and now my jokes have become more about what do i want to say and then i use comedy to lower the barriers to hearing mm. and comedy kind of puts people in a very comfortable position and instead of me being lecturing you you think you're being entertained and i use comedy just as this this medium to to talk to people motivate people help people find mm. their happiness and even if it's only one person out of the 100 people in the audience, the other 99 had a good laugh. It was worth it. Um, mm. And the one person perhaps connected to something. And this has become apparent because I stop looking for well done and congratulations. But the, the thing that really gets my blood pumping is thank you. Because now when I've been coming off stage, people have been going, thank you. Mm. And it's the, I it's, can't explain the feeling. It's like the feeling. feeling, you feel. It, oh, I, I, can't, I can't explain <laughs> the feeling. Yeah, but then, you know, I got to learn that even comedy itself has genres, right? Because yeah. I used to think I don't like comedy because yes. of the few people that 100%. I had listened to. And then my husband said to me, learn to try other people, right? So I started listening to other comedy, yours, for example, and I was like, I actually love this. I actually enjoy it. Thank you. So what type of genre would you say your comedy is? So uh, I, I think my, my genre, and I, I first just want to take the moment to first applaud your husband because that's <laughs> been my message. Like I keep telling yeah. people comedy is a genre, like music is a genre. Mm. And we, we don't all like, like I don't like death rock, but I can mm. hear a death rock band and go, hey, they, yes. they're very good at whatever this is. Mm. They're very good at it. I can acknowledge it. I know it's mm. not for me. You know what I mean? Some R&B, mm -hmm. some pop maybe, uh, you know, maybe that's more, more, my, more my speed. But mm. I advise that. Find the comedian that, that makes you laugh the way you like to laugh. Because at yes. some point, everybody laughs at something. Even if you feel mm. you have no sense of humor, there's <laughs> one topic, there's, there's one something. angle, there's something. So find the comedian. For me, I think it's, it's 
definitely at the moment on purpose motivational comedy. Mm. Um, uh, but it's 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 motivational comedy that's unapologetic because it is. Uh, how do I? It's about personal perspective. Mm. So I think that I don't know if that category exists, but it would be motivational comedy and personal observation. Mm. So it, m all the stories I tell generally are, the, are, are based on the way I experience the world, or the way I experience something. I, mm. I've always felt like I have a, a weird lens compared to everybody else. You know, I have maybe maybe a little bit like the Matrix. Everybody sees <laughs> one picture. I always so you see a see different picture. Another, and <laughs> you know, I've just been mm. blessed with the articulation to describe those things mm. and, and hopefully you know you find them uh, entertaining and first prize for me is you find them relatable and entertaining mm. so tell me how how do you think you're um because with with all the comedy and everything that you're saying you certainly like with comedy you have to experience something for you to be able to speak of yeah. it right or you have to see another to see another person experience it 100%. for you to be able to speak it so how do you think your upbringing shaped the comedian that you are today oh it, it, i think it, it it played every role yeah. possible um my mom is this amazing powerful mm -hmm. positive woman who told me every day how beautiful i was um, and that the way I was was beautiful. Like, I, you know, it helped me very early to stop comparing myself to what the world's perception of beauty is yes. um, mm. and own the fact that I'm beautiful. And until today, I look at myself in the mirror and I see beauty. Like, yes. I always say to people, I wish I had that body dysmorphia thing where I looked at myself and I hated it because that would motivate me to not eat white bread. <laughs> and I look at myself and, and I you're think, like, I'm I good. am gorgeous. <laughs> I'm like, in my lane, I am. Come on, in the land of like, the fat people. Jason Goliath is king. It is what it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the yeah, way I, yeah. I see it. So I had this wonderful mom who was not only super, super strong and and, mm. and, and, and protective and just, you know, worked so hard so that we could have a little bit better, mm. but she also indoctrinated us with basic thoughts of things like choice and consequence. And, and, mm. and, I, and I speak about this on stage where, you know, my mom would always say to me, all I want for you to understand is that the world works on these simple principles. Choice and consequence is one of them. Mm -hmm. And I want you to be smart enough to simply think about the consequences you want to enjoy mm -hmm. and have that inform the choices that you're making. Mm -hmm. Instead of just, you know, shoot and hope, is is try and be a little bit more strategic because if you understand that domino effect, then you can mm -hmm. you can sort of control the direction your yes. life goes, how your life ends up. And choice and consequence has been a big thing. On the comedy side, uh, my dad, an alcoholic, bless him, but a very funny man. Mm. And my dad comes from a very funny family. Mm. So my dad and his brothers are known for roasting. When they get together, they immediately <laughs> just become a team. And yeah. they don't care. And they would roast us, you know, from, from oh, kids. No. Like my mom tells me the story of my dad. One of his greatest joys mm -hmm. of me as a as a kind of sitting on his lap baby was the fact that I was a greedy kid. So he would he would feed me uh, the dried peaches. Mm -hmm. Um, but then the dried apricots look like the dried peaches, but they're sour. So he'd feed me three peaches, and as soon as I get excited, he'd slip an apricot in there oh, no. just to laugh at my face. You know what I mean? Hey, yeah, yeah, make a funny just thing. So, so to give you an idea, like that's yeah. that's the, the the situation I grew up in, which a makes your skin very thick very quickly. Mm. So being teased and roasted, and we call it guara for a guara. Mm. Being teased and roasted immediately makes your skin very thick. But it also allowed me at a very early age to realize that it's just words. Um, mm. and, and, and what they are doing is not a personal attack on me, but more a hunt for jokes and punchlines to make, to make people laugh. Mm. So you stop taking things seriously and you stop allowing people's words to, to, to hurt affect you. you. Mm. So what it did, I think, was uh, help, access, help me access the wit and the ability to have a quick comeback and always have the final word and the final say. Mm. And if you've ever been in one of my shows, you know, don't, don't mm. try me. I'm Champions League, baby. Yes. Don't try me. Mm. Don't try me. When it comes to being off the cuff and, 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 and quick and finding the funny. Uh, and then I also think my, my journey of growing up. So mm. born in, in, in apartheid, live in El Dorado Park, mm. Group Areas Act ends. Also went to a convent while living in El Dorado Park, mm. which meant, unlike a lot of South Africans, I actually had experience or access to other cultures. Because I think mm. one of the major problems with growing up in apartheid is you only knew what you saw. Yes. And generally, if you lived in El Dorado Park, there were only people like you at your school. So you mm. think that this is the whole world. So this we're is the all same. There is. Uh, mm. And even St. David's the same. You know what I mean? You only saw one perspective. And it's easy if you only have one perspective mm. to think your perspective is not only right, but it's that it's the only that it's the only one. 
Group Areas Act ends, I then go to Model C and, and was one of the first brown kids integrated into, a, into mm. a white school. And that helped me learn a totally different culture. So from a comedy point of view, comedy is all about relatability. Mm. And what this upbringing gave me, weirdly, mm. was this access to understanding and respecting everybody's culture. Wow. Mm. Um, so it allows me to empathize. It also allows me to not think my way is the right way and the only way. So now my barometers are... Are you happy mm. the way you live your life? Yes. Are you hurting anybody? If the answer to those is yes, I'm happy, and mm. no, I'm not hurting anybody, then your way can't be wrong in my eyes. Then do I you see. do you <laughs> continue on your on your on your road? Um, so so many attributes of my childhood, I think, I think led to the ability to not only appreciate humor, its importance as a facilitator of narrative, as a facilitator of stories, and mm. its its ability to help break down things. I get to say things on stage that otherwise I think would, would, would evoke uh, uh, anger in people. And I'm always trying to say that we can't have resolution while there's anger. Mm. If we're speaking with all of the emotions on the table, chances are we're not going to get to resolution. But mm. if we're speaking based on the facts, based on what's going on, and I think with, with, with humor, I'm often able to disarm people to be able to facilitate conversation. So 90% of my income comes from corporate facilitation, and that's what mm. I do. I facilitate uh, conferences, I facilitate conversations on stage, I facilitate panel discussions, and I talk on different topics. So whether it be uh, organizational culture, mm. change management, diversity and inclusivity, and I use humor to be able to discuss all of those topics, mm. which which makes the conversation easier. It's like gravy. You know yeah. what I mean? Sometimes that meat is dry. It doesn't <laughs> want to go yeah. down, you know? Put a bit of gravy, helps it go down. It's an amazing skill that you have because, you know, with comedy, it can be very offensive if it's yes. not done well Absolutely. at the same time. And I love how you get to a point where it's also informative because it's not That's just it. about laughing, but it's also learning something out of it. Yes. I've learned um, a lot from just watching some of your comedy. I'm like, oh, I actually learned something, Thank you me. know. And so that's what makes it a skill for me. What makes a good comedian to you? So... Man, what makes a good comedian to me is, is I think Lo Luis Ogola described this best. When he was asked, are you threatened by the onset of digital comedians, TikTok comedians, for example? And he said, no, I'm not because we're different animals. And when the, when the interview asked him, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. He said, uh, a TikTok or a digital comedian can walk into a room of their followers and make them laugh. Mm. A stand-up comedian can walk into a room of people who've never heard of them before and make them laugh. That's and that for one. me is the first sign of a good comedian, is that mm. you don't need people who know you, know your narrative, uh, have heard your stories before mm. uh, in the room to be able to appreciate your comedy. Good comedy is just good comedy. Yes. Um, so I look, at, I look at guys like, I mean, I think my all-time goat, my favorite comedian is the late Bernie Mac, who I just feel like was one of my spirit animals. And if you if you listen to Bernie, very much mm -hmm. like me, he's always playing the idiot. You know <laughs> what I mean? He's always playing the idiot, but he's landing such big uh, mm. social narratives uh, in his in his comedy. Mm. Uh, I think so. Bernie Mac, my personal favorite, the greatest to ever do it, Dave Chappelle. I think you mm. watch you watch Dave Chappelle, yes. and I think I think hands down. So you want to know what makes a good comedian? Uh, is is when I watch Dave Chappelle, mm -hmm. it's like I'm in a lecture. You know, I, I, I remember the first time watching him live, Nicholas Goliath and I were at uh, Just for Laughs, the, the, the big festival. I say the big mm -hmm. festival. It was at the time, it was the biggest comedy festival in the world. So we were so lucky to be there. We got to watch Dave Chappelle mm -hmm. and his kind of comeback tour. And we sat forward. We didn't even laugh. Every time something was funny, <laughs> we just touched each other. You know what I mean? It was like we were so in, engrossed in, in the way he delivered and the fact mm. that for me... Comedy's evolved way beyond joke, 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 mm. joke. You watch Chappelle, it's so fluid, it's so consistently funny, mm. and yet you can't tell joke, joke, yes. joke. It's not just, you know, the the, the standard opening setup, punchline mm. set, you know what I mean? He does it, he does it in such a great way, very much like a chef, mm. you know? So you, we can all have the same ingredients. Mm -hmm. You put a chef next to me, best believe their potatoes are going to be soft <laughs> and delicious. Their gravy is going to yeah. be full of flavor. Uh. Mine is probably going to have too much of something, too little of yeah. something else, cook too quick, cook too slow, you know what I mean? And I, I think a, a great comedian, very much like a chef, can take words and thoughts that you have and prepare them in a way that is so palatable and so much easier to receive and digest. To digest, yeah. So those are the main things. I hope I've answered that question. I got a lot yes, of you <laughs> Yes, you did. You did. So we spoke a bit in the beginning about how um, comedy itself mm. does 
Like when you do your hobbies and you earn from it, it's fulfilling, right? And I I can totally agree with you that when you, especially because in the beginning, you're not doing it to earn money. You're doing it for fun. You know, it's the same thing with me when I started content creation, when I started like even advertising and commercials, it was all about just doing things that I love, right? And when I got my first paycheck, I was like, oh, I can actually get paid for this. (laughs) Do you have a frame? I was so, so, it was so crazy for me. Yeah. I have a frame in my home of the first hundred rand I ever <laughs> earned in stand-up comedy. So I wow. didn't spend that hundred rand. Mm-hmm. I, I saved it. There's a long story behind mm-hmm. it, but the actual hundred rand. I'll never forget. Somebody put one hundred rand note in an envelope. Yeah. And when I opened it up, I was so mad. I was just like, "Bro, you could have just given me this." Hundred. Yeah. The envelope implies that there's going to be more. And it was. It was. It was at wish mm-hmm. in in 2011, probably about a month after it started, and mm-hmm. somebody gave me a hundred rand for jokes. For sure. jokes, for the thoughts that I have in my mind. Yeah. And it blew my mind so much that that money is framed. Do you think that changed your perspective of comedy? Because, like, in the beginning, you got into it for fun, and now you get a point where you know you can actually get paid for it. Did it by any chance impact how you show up? So I think it has to. I think mm. once you once you realize, because, you know, we I wish we didn't live in a capitalistic world where mm. you needed to earn money to live a certain lifestyle. Mm. So for me, the only thing money affords me is experiences. Um, so instead of becoming obsessed about making money, which I was in my in my twenties, mm. uh, my thirties, and now my forties, I've become obsessed with what type of experiences do I want to enjoy. Mm. And uh, you know, I, I use a, a simple sum was. The, my sum in my 20s was success equals happiness. The more money I have, the happier I will be. Yes. <laughs> and I realized that chasing the money is terrible because money is by its nature infinite. It's a number. It is. So if I go, I want to save 100 rand. When I get to 100 rand, I'm not satisfied because my brain goes, I says, you could have 200 rand. Yes. And there's this thing of just wanting more and more and more. Whereas if I said... I want to save enough to buy this glass. Mm. When I have the money, I buy the glass. I have the glass forever and I have the experience that the glass brings and I have that celebration point. Mm. I then go, okay, what do I want next? And I then save or work for for what I want next. Mm. So I- the sum isn't wrong. I was just reading it wrong. Instead of being success equals happiness, I should have been happiness equals success because that equal sign goes both yes. ways. And instead of chasing the success, I now chase the happy. Again, I forgot the question because I'm talking too much. I don't make sure I answer it. Say it again. <laughs> um, no, I was asking, did it change how you show up? Because so you, so yeah. it, it, it's always going to change how you show up. Mm. The second you connect your passion to your lifestyle, there's going to be pressure uh, on that passion. I think a lot yeah. of creatives struggle with that, especially content creators, mm. where you have to just be creating all yeah. the time and you put yourself under pressure and that pressure can often kill that passion mm. uh, very, very easily. So... I've been very fortunate in the sense that, again, it's been about being able to look as far down the road as possible, being able to learn from the mistakes of others. My Mm. attitude is if you've fallen in a pothole and you've told me about it, I'm an idiot for falling in that pothole. So the smart thing is to rather ask you where the potholes are. And I'm always always garnering people's experience. And that's Mm. why the business was set up the way it was so early in our career. So we started Goliath and Goliath officially registered as a business Mm. in 2012, less than a year after we started comedy, Mm. because I realized very quickly, I never want to not enjoy what I'm doing, but I also need to make sure that the money is being taken care of in a proper fashion and that we are monetizing this business as a business. So Mm. you've obviously got to realize that your art is an asset. And I think most artists don't have enough business acumen to understand A, what an asset is and B, Mm. how you then sweat that asset and make that asset work for you. So what I did is I removed myself from that by handing all of that stress to Kate. So Kate is my sister and our, and our managing director, and she manages the three of us mm-hmm. uh, as, as the head of Goliath and Goliath, which allowed the three of us to focus just on the craft mm. and to be just a comedian. So when you're booking me, I refer you to Kate. If, you, if you're contacting me, it must be your first time booking me. <laughs> yeah. uh, otherwise, you, you call Kate directly. Mm. I spent enough time with Kate helping her understand the way I would negotiate. So now she can negotiate on my behalf Mm. and I only get involved if there's something bizarre, something Mm. she hasn't seen before. Um, And the major control was now that I only have to think about the jokes, which means I can be your Mm -hmm. friend and I don't have to think about the commercial elements Mm. because those are being taken care of by the back end of the business. Mm. The the second thing that I did, which which I think was just so smart and helped us, is as soon as that that kind of back-end operation was running and smooth, Mm. is I asked Kate to stop telling us what she'd quoted. So 
the money has this weird thing in our mind and it will manage your tolerances. So if a client, for example, and negotiated the heck out mm-hmm. of you, got you at, at a for free rate, and it's normally that client that mm. goes, says things like, while you're here, let me give you extra work, <laughs> yeah, and then well. loads you on, your tolerance to deliver then changes because yes. you go, this is not worth my while, not worth my time. Mm. But in order to be great, particularly in the competitive sector that we play in, I realized consistency was going to be key. So how do we, as a group, consistently deliver deliver at 120%? How do we deliver at 120% is I don't know what I'm earning. Until I see the list at the end of the month, I rock up at every gig as if this is the biggest paycheck I'm going to get for the month. You are my most important customer. Uh, Whether it's a charity and we're earning zero or whether it's a big blue chip client, Mm. of which we have many, thank God, thank you to all our clients from the bottom (laughs) bottom of my debit orders, thank you. (laughs) <laughs> from the bottom, from the bottom. Um, and that's the way that I've been able to kind of separate it. And it was the mm. smartest thing we ever did. So now when you see me, A, know that I'm, I don't know what I'm earning. And B, I'm there because I'm obsessed with being great on stage. And that's it. That's the only thing. That's the only thing that matters. And therefore, we get consistency throughout um, because we haven't allowed capitalism to put that pressure that everybody else experiences on us. Not easy. Costs a lot of money. (laughs) Kate lives in a nicer house than I do. Um, (laughs) But worth it. Worth it, worth it, worth it. It really is worth it. And I totally agree with you. I love um, how you've set up your business Mm -hmm. because um, I always say, coming from a chartered accountancy perspective, I always say every business, regardless of whether it's your normal corporate business or it's your media entertainment type of business, it needs the right processes in place because if as the owner and the comedian at the same time, you know what you're earning, you sort of also, you can miss certain opportunities that might not cost much today to the other person but might be worth it in the long term. So my attitude then becomes every single time I'm on stage or I have a microphone in front of me, that's my business card. Mm. So I'm in the business of making stuff for people. So it's either a live audience. Mm. Um, and David Carr once pulled me aside and gave me great advice. And, and mm-hmm. you know, so it's easy with, with comedians to go, mm. don't worry about the small audiences. Use them to, to, to work your new stuff. Yeah. Um, and then David Carr pulled me aside and he said, I never want to see that again. I said, what do you mean? He said, from now on, you work your new stuff in the middle. I said, what does that mean? He said, you've got to start great, end great. Yes. Because you'd, even if there's five people in the room, you don't know who those five who, people yes. are and what opportunities they may hold mm. for you. So it's never okay to die on stage, is what mm. David said to me. So if you want to try something, you try it in the middle of your set so that by the end of your set, the audience would have forgotten about how you may have been average in a spot. Mm. So you do your great stuff up front, you try new stuff in the middle, you close with stuff that is your best, that you make you making sure, making sure. So it's about that that consistency and pride and finding a peaceful middle ground between the artist's pride yes. um, and the actual objective. So for me, the reason I do well at corporate shows, and I can be honest, is because I think a lot of artists have the pride of whenever they, they wield a microphone, it must be their show, mm. their way their content, their narrative, Mm. and you hear the attitude of, oh, you shouldn't have booked a comedian if you're going to get offended. With me, when when I come off any of my corporate clients, Mm. when I go on, it's not the Jason Goliath show. Mm. It's your show. Jason Goliath is a facilitator of your show Mm. and he'll use his experience as a comedian to enhance the brand Mm. rather than work against the brand to drive his own narrative. If you want to see Jason Goliath, you buy a ticket for a show that says Jason Goliath. (laughs) Then you get the raw version of me and I can unleash the full artist that Mm. is me, the way I want to articulate it and the way I'd like my art to be appreciated. But in corporate and public spaces, first we're there to entertain. Mm. We are not there to offend. Mm. We are smart enough to know where those parameters lie. Yeah. And then just, just stick to the rules and you'll be rewarded. I love that. Words of wisdom out here. <laughs> we are trying. We are trying. <laughs> so tell me, if you, if you were to... If you were... Because you've mentioned your wife a bit. Yeah. You know, during this podcast. Yes. So what do you think has been her role in the Jason Goliath we see today? So that's, that's a great question. So you know, my wife, my wife plays so many roles, and mm. uh, it's hard to play the role of a comedian's wife. And she often jokes about the fact that she's going to write a set about what 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 really needs to happen. Yeah. But I'll give an example. I was on a conference last week for, mm. for one of my biggest clients, and and my wife understands how important it is for me. Um, she also then understands that because I'm an artist, I'm very sensitive and. Mm. 
my mood off stage, even with experience, often affects my performance. Mm -hmm. So my wife was going through a bad week. Mm. And what does she do? Keep quiet. Saves it for when I get home. Do you understand how difficult that is? Do you understand it's how special hard. this woman is that she will prioritize you. my ability to do my favorite thing because mm. she respects and appreciates and supports how important it is to me and puts herself second? Mm. So my wife is the biggest angel in the in the army because my wife has to suck things up so that I can do the things I need to do. Wow. So what I'm saying is being married to me, which I assume being married to any entertainer, is not fair. So you always have this thing of, you know, your wife must be the, at the top of your your your, 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 your pyramid and mm. all other things must be underneath that for a, for a marriage to work. Mm. So, for example, as an accountant, it would you would never put accounting before your husband. It's mm. very easy because as, as good as you are about accountant, there's no accountant that is as passionate and sensitive mm. uh, about their output like an artist is there's a mm. very big difference so it becomes you become unnaturally attached to the importance because it's not just feeding your lifestyle mm. it's feeding your soul uh, my wife knows if i'm not on stage for seven days my personality starts to Changes. change she knows she's like hey go tell people jokes <laughs> go, go, go tell people jokes i can see it you coming it. <laughs> i can i can i can see it coming mm. so it is it is incredibly difficult so other than the the the, the major role she plays as a as a, as a publicist and mm. her experience in that in that space the number one role is is uh, her putting in great effort to make sure that I have everything I need mm. to do what I want to do at the level I believe I'm capable of doing it at. Uh, so she's an angel. If you see my wife in the streets, please give her a high five. We'll people, do people don't that. know how, how much that poor woman goes through. No, um, shout out to and her. How much, how much sacrifices she makes um, mm. so that I can fly and have my dreams come true. And often. Often, please mm. send her this clip so that she knows I acknowledge. She puts her, she puts my dreams before her own, sure. and the reason I know how difficult that is is because I wouldn't be able to do it. Mm. I wouldn't. Uh, that's the truth. Shout out to Love you. Her, baby. Shout so out much. to you. She's amazing. You know, and I, I won't lie. It's difficult for women to keep things in. If you want to talk about it, you want to talk it's about impossible. it. Impossible. <laughs> like, no, but let's talk now. And I, and I, and I realize that. Like yeah. I realize, I realize that it is. It is impossible, and she often does. Often, the impossible is 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 re required of her, mm. and she comes through every single time. She comes through every single time. Yeah, when they say that for every successful husband, there is a what do they say? There's an amazing yeah. woman behind, behind, behind every, every successful strong husband. Man, there's a stronger woman. I think that's <laughs> yes. what you should say. Yeah. Yes. So shout out to her. She's amazing, and I think that really in itself drives um, your ability to perform. Absolutely. And it does certainly help because, like you're saying, with entertainment, it's difficult after a conflict to be able to show up. You know, in, in the right manner, especially with comedy. Absolutely. <laughs> I think it's you can't make hard. people laugh when you want to cry. Mm. You, you, when you're angry and you know, I must go make people laugh very difficult that's true that's true and just um, towards the end of this podcast what I'd need you to tell us mm. is obviously fame and power yeah. is amazing money is great but it comes with its own challenging as well yeah. growth comes with its own challenges mm. how do you cope with um, you know mental health around the hate comments, people that dislike you because you're not going to be everybody's cup of tea as well. Yeah. So how do you cope with that? So, I mean, it's not easy. People are cruel, um, mm. particularly, you know, they call them the keyboard warriors, those that, you know, can speak without consequence or will say a hateful yes. thing and then just move on, forget yeah. about you. The first thing is to realize that they move on, mm. is that they're not thinking about you all the time. They're thinking mm. about their own problems. They're thinking about the next thing. Um, the second thing, and this is my, my big sentence, mm. If you want to be average, everybody's going to love you. Yes. But in order to be great, there will be the... So if you're average, everybody will like you. Mm. But if you want greatness, some people will love you and some people will hate you. So if you don't have people not liking you, that's a problem. you're average. You haven't made it. <laughs> I'm, and that's, that's my truth. I agree. That's my truth. Mm. If, you, if you are truly obsessed with what you, with what you want um, and are making strides and making a difference, you're always going to have two factions. Mm. I use... Kanye mm. There are those that absolutely love her and there are those that absolutely despise her. Mm. Both people talk about her. Mm. And that's the big thing. That's the big thing. If they are talking about you, you're winning. What they're saying doesn't matter. So don't give that power. 
I love that. And that's amazing. I think I've also had to learn that myself. Not easy. Because we, we're <laughs> Sometimes, humans. We, yeah. we hurt. And I think we, we associate being liked with growth sometimes because you're looking at it and you're saying, for me, and I think social media has a way of doing yeah. that. The more likes you have, the more comments 100%, 100%. you have, <laughs> the more famous you are, 100%. the more powerful you become. So I think now the digital side of life is teaching us that the more you have people following you and liking you, the more you're doing well. But it's also good to remember that even at that, um, it's okay to have people that will not like you because you're not for everyone as well. But th then you must make sure that your, your support structure really like you. Mm. So again, my wife comes up. Whenever I yes. want to reply nasty, <laughs> my wife steps in. Like, like I was about, somebody wrote some terrible stuff about me and then blind. Uh, so they didn't, they, they wrote my full name but didn't tag me. And mm. I got it from a number of people. Hey, somebody's, and it was somebody big in the industry. Yeah. And I typed this very aggressive, very uh, uh, sarcastic reply. And my wife used the phrase, she said, please do not get involved. I said, what do you mean? She said, you're just going to amplify that situation. And mm. that's exactly what this person wants. I said, yeah, but I can't just let these words be out yeah. there. She said, the problem with fighting with a pig is you get dirty and the pig enjoys it. Yes, those and were, now you're, were, the, you're together. Hundred <laughs> percent. Those, those were her words. Yeah. So not only does she calm me down in those instances, but I mean, I posted a video last week mm -hmm. of, of somebody said, ah, oh, this toilet humor is disgusting. I can't believe people laugh at it. And I was going to be very, very snooty in my reply. Mm -hmm. And then my wife said, please don't be snooty. Be funny. <laughs> it's okay. Be funny. Don't be yeah. arrogant. Be funny. So reply by all means, but be funny. So instead of instead of being aggressive or, mm. under, or, or, or undermining or, or mm. you know, I, I made a joke. I said, hey, listen, you know, we, uh, toilet humor is definitely not for everybody, but yeah. I, definitely, I bought my first house telling toilet humor <laughs> jokes. Selling, yeah. And it's the one thing that we all do. And I did a whole uh. bit, uh, which I preferred. So it's also, you know, be surrounded by people who 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 help you constantly be the best version, version of, you. of yourself because you can easily be you know oh, mixed man, up in all get, the drama. Oh, you can get <laughs> caught into things that don't matter so easy. Yeah. So should we be expecting any upcoming events? Anything you want to let us know about that we should show up at? So, <laughs> I've got a, I've got a number of things coming up. So please mm -hmm. follow my follow my social media. I've got a couple of uh, 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 big TV shows and internet shows. Um, I've also got a big one-man show coming up. I'm just waiting for, for final dates, and that'll be... Okay. Uh, I, I think I owe, I owe Johannesburg a big one, so I'm, I'm thinking of a ly Lyric Theatre. Um, and then I've also been promising to tour, um, you know, in between all of the millions of other things that I do. But until I come to you, you know, if you have a device and you see a little logo, logo that says Red Bull TV, it's a free thing. You don't need mm. to register. It's not like Netflix or Showmax where you need a subscription <laughs> and all of the information. Okay. Just click on that Red Bull TV icon and search Giving It Gears with Jason Goliath. So I've got I've got a full series season, uh, season one. The final episode will come out towards the, the end of the year of uh, a great show that I do on Red Bull TV called Giving It Gears with Jason Goliath. It's also mm. a free show to watch, so please go and watch that. Uh, catch the repeats of Celebrity Game Night. Um, because even if you watched it, it's still it's still it's so great, <laughs> yeah. so great to watch. Um, and then I'm 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 coming. I'm working. I'm working. I promise you, I'm working. I'm busy, and I'm bringing you laughs as much as I can. Um, I'm also trying to you know just invest in the the social media audience. So thank you if you've been following me up until now. And what you can expect is jokes now. Okay, okay. I'm I'm I'm, I'm done playing playing games. I'm coming with funny things now on social Yay. media as well. And we cannot wait. Do you know what's amazing is I got to know... Oh, oh, oh also, oh. artistry. So we just signed a deal <laughs> with Jay Somethings, with Jay Something yes, Space. Jay Something mm. built this amazing space. Him and his business partners called mm. Artistry to celebrate artists. It's in Santon, Fredman Drive. It's got an amazing rooftop restaurant. It's got an unbelievable listening bar. But it's also got a little theater that we do comedy in every Sunday night. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for stand-up, uh, every Sunday, 6 o'clock, 150 bucks, the best comics in the, in the, in the, in the country on stage. And I think that is going to be the comedy room of the future. So go to Artistry in Joburg every Sunday, uh, uh, 6 o'clock, 150 yes. bucks. And the vibe is amazing. I've been there right. as well. <laughs> yeah. But thank you so much for coming. Thank it's you for been me. amazing having you here. The, the pleasure has been mine. I feel <laughs> like I spoke too much. Let me drink, drink water just so I No, you control. you were amazing. I'm sure people cannot wait to watch this. I'm I'm actually tempted to make it my first for season two. <laughs> I, listen, I, I let me be the poster boy for season two. I appreciate that. <laughs> no, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you for having me and well done.